So I'd like to, I'd like to go back to the Second World War and try to look into this techno-political crucible of the um, that gives lays the basis for a possible uh, financial governance. And I think it's essential to start uh, with this meaning of technology or technoscience, military power, and politics. And for that I have a short excerpt from a great film by Lutz Stambeck called Das Netz. wird die Elite amerikanischer und internationaler Ingenieure und Wissenschaftler ausgebildet. Das MIT ist auch Vorreiter für eine enge Partnerschaft zwischen dem Militär und den Universitäten. Diese Zusammenarbeit beginnt im Ersten Weltkrieg und setzt sich im Zweiten Weltkrieg fort, wo Technologie kriegsentscheidend wird. Am 13. August 1940 eröffnet die deutsche Luftwaffe die Schlacht um England. Kurz nach Beginn der deutschen Angriffe bietet der 1886 in Chicago geborene Mathematiker und Physiker Norbert Wiener sein Wissen für den Abwehrkampf gegen den Faschismus an. Wiener lehrt am MIT als Professor für Mathematik und hat sich schon im Ersten Weltkrieg mit Fragen der Ballistik und Artillerie beschäftigt. Wie kann man eine Maschine bauen, die Bewegungen von Jagdfliegern im Voraus berechnet, um diese dann abschießen zu können? mit seiner Maschine, die Grenze zwischen Mensch und Maschine verwischt und es entsteht ein anonymes, mechanisiertes Gegenüber, dessen Handlungen nun in den Kriegslaboratorien modelliert und berechnet werden. Obwohl Wieners Maschinen bis Kriegsende nicht einsetzbar sind, entwickelt er davon ausgehend das Modell einer neuen Wissenschaft, die als Kybernetik bekannt wird. Kybernetik beschäftigt sich mit der Frage, wie Nachrichtenübertragung in Maschinen und Lebewesen funktioniert. Die Basis der Kybernetik ist die Annahme, dass das menschliche Nervensystem Realität nicht abbildet, sondern errechnet. Der Mensch erscheint nun als ein informationsverarbeitendes System. Das Denken als Datenverarbeitung und das Gehirn als eine Fleischmaschine. Das Gehirn ist nicht mehr der Ort, an dem sich auf geheimnisvolle Art und Weise das Ich und Identität durch Erinnerung und Bewusstsein bildet. Es ist eine Maschine, die aus Schalt- und Regelkreisen, aus Rückkopplungsschleifen und aus Kommunikationsknoten besteht. Eine Blackbox, in der in einem Kreislauf die Ursache Wirkung und die Wirkung Ursache ist. Ein geschlossenes Rückkopplungssystem mit In- und Output, den man kontrollieren und berechnen kann. Nicht mehr wie bisher ausgehend von Naturanschauung, 
sondern von unbezweifelbarer Mathematik und Logik. Wieners Zukunftsvision von einer kommenden kybernetischen Gesellschaft liefert nun für den neuen politisch-militärischen Status der USA als Supermacht die wissenschaftliche Legitimation. Kybernetik wird zur neuen globalen Leitwissenschaft, die fortan unter wechselnden Etiketten weiterentwickelt wird. Aus einer Theorie wird weltweite Praxis. So what Dambeck captures, I think brilliantly in the sequence, is the, the emergence of a ethyl mechanical being, a, a notion where the machine, the organism, and information are placed on the same ontological plane and come to constitute the same being, an ethyl mechanical being. And I think this is fundamental for understanding the post-war period. I think it's in this sense that the disciplinary paradigm that Foucault analyzes stretching back to the, the 16th century uh, reaches its culmination. Because there, there is the idea that uh, rather than making the human act like a machine, you can actually create the human as a machine. It's a, a, again an extremely powerful idea. and. It has been, uh, it has had many, many consequences. I take the, the, the notion of the World War II regime from uh, a guy named Andy Pickering, who wrote this article, Cyborg History in the World War II Regime. And what he analyzes, particularly in this article, is the new form of applied science that was developed during the Second World War under the name of operations research. This is something that was building up since the late 19th century. You had, especially in Germany and in the United States, large corporations, the chemical concerns in Germany and the electrical companies in the United States were the two focuses of this, where scientists were employed in direct contact with industrial processes. So the scientists began not only to explore the universe theoretically and experimentally, but to create new machines and new productive processes under the direct management of the industrial capitalists. What happened in the war in both countries was that these uh, processes of organized innovation were taken over by the state and vastly amplified in a moment of hegemonic rivalry where what was at stake was who would become the new power that would replace Great Britain as the most important power in the world. And so there were tremendous pressure to uh, apply science in every way possible to the war effort. So here we have some definitions of operations research. The effective use of scarce resources under dynamic and uncertain conditions. Short definition, a longer one. In operations research work, team members are encouraged to abstract mental techniques from the disciplines and apply them to concrete problems of operationality. These mental techniques are augmented with novel quantifying techniques, some of which were refined within operations research work itself. These techniques include statistical summarization and inference, Monte Carlo simulation, queuing theory, and eventually game theory. Um, so, Pickering himself writes this paragraph, I could read to you, unlike the traditional natural sciences that find their ontology in the material world, the ontology of operations research was the operation, the performance of a heterogeneous assemblage of humans and non-humans, of planes, submarines, radar sets and radar operators, pilots, depth charges, etc. As is science, concerned with the business of fighting wars, operations research was indifferent to the traditional distinctions between people and things that define the boundaries between the classic academic 
dissidents. The Anti-Submarine Warfare Operations Research Group constructed a unitary mathematical model from which issued in one direction suggestions for improving the material technologies of radar and in the other suggestions for the human conduct of anti-submarine warfare. This lumping together of the human and the non-human and the unprincipled working of both sides of the boundary in the name of overall performativity is what I want to point to in naming operations research as cyborg science. Okay, and this goes on in a very interesting way. And of course, you can see all the relations to Bruno Tour's work that, that are involved there. And that, that article was written quite a long time ago. I'm not sure if Latour had ever even developed his, his work uh, uh, at the time. One of the major biggest projects of operations research was effectively the uh, creation of radar. The second one was the atomic bomb, the two biggest ones both came out of the United States. Although uh, radar actually there was a lot of work done in Britain on that. Uh, in, for the British scientists, uh, I think uh, British and also uh, refugee German science, scientists from all over the world obviously collaborated. Function and the elements of the new regime gradually emerged. Bretton Woods we already talked about. It created a system where exchange rates were stable like this, like a flat line. They didn't move. Starting in, this is actually 1968 here, you see that the major currencies, the Deutsche Mark, the Swiss franc, the yen, um, the Belgian franc, and so on, start to diverge still in a, in a regulated way. That was regulated by the IMF. This was supposed to happen like this. It wasn't supposed to happen like this as it, as it starts to happen in 1971. They make various attempts until 1973, over a period of two years, to control it using the provisions of the IMF, complex things that I won't want to get into. Well, they're actually in the news today, the so-called special drawing rights, which was a form, really, of money that was supposed to be emitted by the IMF itself, which would, which would be used so as to provoke uh, the stabilization of the currencies. It didn't work. And so from 1973 on, you have this. An entirely new environment. An entirely new environment. Which means that, what does it mean? If you're engaging in an international business, say you're going to produce something, you might want to be installing a plant in Latin America. It's clearly going to take you two or three years to build that plant, and another couple of years before you get anything back from it. If you project that on the basis of a yen, that's worth this much today because you'll you want to sell that in yen, say. And when you actually get around to selling it, the yen is this. How is that going to work? How can you do anything internationally if you have to confront this environment of the fluctuation of the value of currencies? Well, that is the basic problem that leads to the entire, uh, this great communicational, this great decentered uh, multinational communicational space that Jameson says we are caught in as individual subjects. That problem of the impossibility to predict what the values of the multiple currencies that anyone engaging in transactional commerce must juggle on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and year-to-year -year basis. So what happens? What happens can be summed up, I think, in, in uh, four words, Milton at the Merck. Milton Friedman, I was asked by a guy named Melamed, who, run, who ran at the time, and I'm not sure if he still runs, the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange, to write a paper on the uh, advisability of creating futures markets and currencies. He did that. He asked, I believe, the sum of uh, $5,000 for that, which was quite a bit at the time. And Shortly thereafter, in 1972, he rang the bell, the Chicago Brooklyn Dollar Exchange, for the first currency futures market. And what that allowed people to do was to buy a contract which would give them the right to purchase a certain kind of a currency at a future date. In other words, one could plan. One could, book, one could pay now for insurance that at that future date, the currency you could get the currency at the value that you needed for your industrial plan to come to fruition. That future is a contract that can only be done by, in the person who sells it has to invest in a whole spread of currencies 
so that the rise of one will be cancelled out by the fall of the other. In other words, they have to have a basket of currencies to make that possible. And to do that, they have to manage, minute by minute and hour by hour, the buying and selling of those currencies so as to make, in the end, that wild fluctuation come down, not to a flat line, but to a line which includes the profit for them and a predictable future for the other. It's only one year later that the first networked currency, not trading platform, but information platform, appears by Reuters. That machine there is the first one to hook into a global cable network and give you real-time information about what currency is trading for right now. And on the basis of that machine and all, that opens up what the Lusitari would call a phylum, which is infinitely expanding, which never stops. And that phylum of, of machines is the one that's inhabited by the currency traders who today are trading their heads off and creating this unprecedented volume of exchange that happened on this day, this historic day, uh, where the greatest you know, volume of exchange in history have just happened today, on the basis of vastly more sophisticated machines than that. So I think if we wanted to look at, uh, try to list maybe what could be some of the ingredients in the emergence of, of a regime of financialization. Interesting to know that the ARPANET, the, the, the uh, beginning, the first, you know, there's actually four computers connected into a network spanning the U.S., huh? from the West Coast to the East Coast, was connected in 1969. The microprocessor, there were already transistors, of course, but the chip itself invented in 1971. The NASDAQ, which has become the, you know, the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations, therefore with computers in there, which has become the great stock exchange for technology companies, was actually founded in 1971. The SWIFT network, on which your capacity to use an ATM machine depends, Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, founded in <coughs> 1973. I believe that thing is run out of Switzerland, although I think it was a Belgian company who founded it. The CBOT Options Exchange, the <coughs> Chicago Board of Trade, Options Exchange, Options, I will discuss a little later what it is, was founded in 1973 also. And then this is crucial, the OPEC oil shock, the first one occurred in 1973. Now what happened? What happened, of course, I remember, what happened is there was a long line at the pump. And when you got there, I mean really, you know, I was a kid, it was, you know, 20 minutes. And when you got there, there was a big surprise. You had to pay four times more than before. That means that from one day to the next, four times more money for the key product of the, of the industrial civilization was flowing essentially to uh, the Middle East, essentially to Saudi Arabia. and the, who are organized into the consortium of the oil producing and exporting countries. What did they do with the money? The pillow was too small. They could not do anything with that money then send it back to the Western banks. Now it's said, and I've never really been able to verify this with the degree of historical security that I would like to have, that the American State Department informed the uh, Saudis that this was fine and that if indeed they used all the money to buy American goods and to create huge new cities in Saudi Arabia, this was fine. And if they didn't use the money to buy American engineering and products and create huge new cities in Saudi Arabia, they would be invaded. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to be true. Basically, it seems to be true. And you will also note that the focus of war at this moment shifted from the Asian theater, Korea, uh, uh, Vietnam, with the ever-present threat of China, to the Middle East. So the threat of war in the Middle East became a reality from essentially 1967 and then the key 1973 Yom Kippur War, uh, uh, which, which, which the oil shock was in direct response to, you know, uh, from that time forth. Huh? So, at the same time, the first personal computer was launched, the Altair, the ancestor of the Macintosh and the PC. And a few years later, the whole process was brought to a culmination by a guy named Paul Volcker. He's still around, one of Obama's advisors. 
He is nominally a Democrat. It's hard to understand what a Democrat is. Uh, and he applied, according to the theories of Milton Friedman, the so-called, what we now call the Volcker shock, which was rising the, the uh, treasury interest rate up to 20%, resulting in a, in a bank rate of 21% at its peak in 1981. This had many, many effects. What it was supposed to do was perform the theories of Milton Friedman, who said everything has to do with the money supply. The money supply is too big, we have to contract it. That proved to be totally false. And it's, it's called the monetary turn, but in fact, that aspect of Friedman's theory was totally abandoned ever since because it didn't actually work that way at all. What it did do was to make the price of money to be borrowed by, for instance, a small business in the United States huge so that small businesses were wiped out in the United States at this moment. A kind of austerity regime was imposed by that. You couldn't borrow money. Many people, there was huge unemployment at the time, two-figure unemployment, 12, 13%, I, I think it was 11%, maybe higher. But that's big in the United States. A massive expansion of big corporate actors, that's something that happened in kind of domestic in the United States. But two other things happened. With one, first of all, every time a Latin American, uh, African, also Middle Eastern, poor Asian country, which had borrowed money, encountered a crisis, and when asking for more, they would get it, because there was all that OPEC oil money in the hands of the Western banks. They were given the money, and then every time they had to borrow again, if that, when that time came in 1981, they then had to refinance the loan at 20%. This is devastating. And this was the beginning of what's called the debt crisis. The money had been loaned in the course of the 70s. It was in many cases spent in very corrupt ways or on great engineering projects that were worthless, or white elephants and so on. And then when it had to be refinanced in the global uh, uh, recession of the, the late, of the 70s, and especially the late 70s, at this moment, it had to be refinanced under these terms. That was when the IMF really began to act as the governing system, telling countries in detail what to do with their economies and therefore with their social policy. So you have a kind of government, just as was said by Westerbrook in the City of Gold and by, by Holmes and Marcus, the anthropologist, that operates through the technocratic process of economics and whose you know, most visible instance is the IMF, but where the behind it is basically the, the, the private banks and that coalition of private banks known as the Federal Reserve Bank. So this Volcker shock had a second effect. It, and this was the thing that got the United States out of its recession and opened up the present era. The second effect was that you could get 20% interest on a loan in the United States. That means that if you have a million dollars, where are you going to put it? You're going to put it not in your own country. You're going to put it in the United States because there you can make money on it. And so what the United States did, it was thought that the, United, that the American hegemony had been broken by the end of Bretton Woods. Because America no longer controlled the currency. It was no longer all attached to the American dollar, which in turn was attached to gold, right? That was the Bretton Woods system. America had run out of gold, it could no longer back its dollars in gold, the Bretton Woods system collapsed. This was thought to be the end of the American agenda. But it turned out that America, uh, for a short time, had these high interest rates, but also had this vastly developed financial system, which would then from that point forth, absorb the savings and the accumulated profits of basically the entire world, which would then be recycled into uh, the financial operations where money is made out of money, and then increasingly, after the end of the Soviet Union, into vast uh, uh, investment of money into fixed cap capital. And those two processes of financial speculation and of transnational capital investment creating productive capital, so what Marx calls fixed capital, would be managed by that link between New York and London that we saw on the Hibernian Atlantic map at the start. Because London, although, uh, uh, although Britain lost its military hegemony and its ability to control world politics as it had done for the period of British Empire, and especially from the mid-19th century to the um, 
really throughout the 19th century to the, the first part of the uh, 20th, the accumulated expertise of finance developed during the British period of financialization remained. And so the two key cities were then New York, London, and then the third one, of course, Tokyo. But you can't really compare Tokyo to London in terms of capacity to manage other people's money. So basically, I think these events, although not the complete explanation of the financialization, give you some kind of a understanding both of the technological ends, of the institutional ends of it, and of the geopolitical ends of it. I should put this bit up here. Let's see. I, I organize it according to dates, that's why. But, so three things, technological, um, institutional, organizational, and geopolitical uh, elements that go into financialization. And I guess I can actually press forward and, 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 and uh, explain a couple of other things. Now, those things happened, and they ushered in an era of a very complex transnational management of money, which ultimately led to the development of very sophisticated technologies to manage that money. Those sophisticated technologies, of course, have been the focus of scientific development in the Western world, and particularly in the developed world, and particularly in the United States since the Second World War. Uh, the entire group of thinkers who, who uh, contributed to that development uh, had been called, for about 30 years, cyberneticians. At this time, there was a transformation in the discourse of cybernetics. And basically, it can be said that some people wanted out of the rationalist plan of the state into which they had been inducted by the Second World War. And so what you see is a very interesting shift where a part of the cybernetic discourse becomes countercultural. You see it very clearly in the figure of Gregory Bateson, who goes on to become an ecological thinker. You see it clearly in two figures, I will, uh, three figures I'll mention, the, the Chilean duo of Maturana and Barrera, the Austro-American scientist Heinz von Forster, and oddly enough, you see it in the most technocratic cybernetician of them all, a guy named Forster, who produced the science that gave rise to this very famous study of limits of growth, which was done by the agents of the Club of Rome, which was a European lead organization that again was trying to respond to the crisis. So they engaged uh, Forrester uh, and his, uh, some of his um, students, uh, the, the, the Meadows, uh, uh, Dan, the two of the Meadows couple, I, I actually forget the Daniela, I forget who, um, to write this book, which tried to show that this is the first time when people realized that unlimited industrial growth would provoke a crisis somewhere around 2030. Interesting, huh? Uh, a very, very famous, very shocking thing, which I'm sure you've all heard, uh, the Limits to Growth Report. It tries to show that, that you know, uh, the, various, that, that the ecological carrying capacity of the planet will not be able to sustain infinite industrial growth. What's kind of ironic about this is that Forrester is one of the people who developed the science of industrial dynamics and actually contributed to the runaway growth of the post-war period. I'll discuss that uh, another moment. So if you have a, 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 in this moment of crisis, cybernetics itself begins to shift. Again, it has to do, uh, that actually comes from uh, this guy who was a businessman, an Italian guy named Pecci, who saw this diagram about technological progress and began to get really worried. And he said these things, Strangely enough, in a speech to the Military Academy in Buenos Aires in 1965, why there, I don't exactly know, but Aurelio Peche says, the causes which determine the growing gap between various types or levels of society in the world today are essentially technological progress and organizational efficiency. The third factor, which has recently acquired importance, is that of optimum size. It does not take too much it does not take much to realize that these factors reach their maximum values in the United States. Indeed, they are measured in relation to practice established there. If we can 
conduct a more detailed examination, we realize that each factor acts as a multiplier of the other, with the result that their combination impresses on the North American society an extraordinary dynamism, such as indeed be catapulted into an orbit of its own, different from that of any other country. So again, you have someone like Brzezinski who begins to experience a deep anxiety about the acceleration of technological development. In this case, it's from a European perspective, looking upon the United States as essentially becoming almost another world, another planet. He uses this type of language in the theory of old text. Again, you can download this from the Corona Pro website. And so, this is what lay in the background of the funding of this study, which eventually was produced <coughs> in 1972. And this was a major shock to people on planet Earth, that this study. This is a very historical thing, because it was realized that industrial progress had its limits. So, in this case, cybernetics contributed to indicating its own contradiction. The vast increase in industrial pro production made possible by the whole the, the feedback engineering uh, 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 revealed itself in the very language of feedback in engineering to be uh, unsustainable. And the word unsustainability came into you know, use at that time and this, this led to our environmental concepts of today. Other cyberneticians went through very interesting changes. Uh, Francisco Varela and Alberto Maturana. Maturana says this in the introduction to this historic book, Autopoiesis and Cognition. He says, early in May of 1968, the University of Chile entered a state of revolution. The students had taken over the university in an attempt to reformulate the philosophy that had inspired its organization. I joined them. All student academic activities stopped, and students and some members of the faculty tried to say something new. It was not easy. Language was a trap, but the whole experience was a wonderful school in which one could discuss how mute, deaf, and blind one was. It was easy to be caught in one's own ego, but if one succeeded in attaining at least some degree of freedom from it, one began to listen, and one's language began to change. And then, but only then, new things could be said. This lasted for several months. Fascinating anecdote. And the new things that were said were these. What emerged from Maturana and Varela was a new concept of biology, understood as what they called the realization of the living. Instead of looking at organisms, living organisms, as uh, component parts subject to laws of causality, and instead of subordinating individual beings to the evolution of the species, they proposed that the living being is distinguished by its capacity to continually reproduce the integrity of its own organization and thus to maintain the networks of its parts over time. The living realizes itself by engaging in continuous self-creation. What this means, fundamentally, is that they're no longer imagining the living being with any kind of mechanistic causality. They're proposing that the, the defining factor of life is its autonomy. And they are proposing that out of the crisis of 1968 as a scientific theory, which, by the way, is a dense and respected and influential one. So that was me summing up uh, Maduro and Varela. Now I'm going to quote from their book, Autopoiesis and Cognition. They say, wherever there is autopoiesis, that is self-creation, self-poiesis, self-production, there cannot be any, funnel, any fundamental determination of the living being by an outside force. Because its being, or its capacity to maintain its own organization, is always given by itself in the present. Language, then, is not the capacity to obtain instrumental knowledge of living beings. Think about McNamara when you hear this. It is but the capacity of the autopilot entity to reflect on its own changing states and perceptions and on the particular deformations in its own state that others cause in its proximity. Language is the capacity for the entity to create a frame of reference that will orient its own autopoiesis for as long as it can maintain itself up to its own death. The significance of this scientific reflection on the integrity of the living and the role of language during the Chilean attempt to establish its own non-capitalist social system is surely self-evident. This is an example of, of 
how the unbearability of the post-war Fordist industrial system, that cybernetic system of almost total control, brought about a revolt in epistemology, in the very foundations of the science, in this case the science of biology. And the nature of that revolt was to indicate the autonomy of the living being. That means, essentially, you cannot plan my destiny. You cannot integrate me into your machine. For I, as a living being, am not a part of that machine. I maintain my network of parts as a whole for the entire duration of my life. And although you may cause a deformation in my environment, you have not affected you have not in any way touched or transformed the essence of this capacity for self-creation, which is what defines any living being. That's a, a protest of autonomy from the you know, kind of planning control that in, in occurs in science itself. And it's echoed by someone who is right at the heart of the military-industrial complex, who had been part of the discourse of cybernetics basically since its inception, the Austrian uh, uh, scientist and philosopher of science, Heinz von Forster, who is a good friend of Maturana and Varela, and who says these things. He says them in 1979, but in fact he was saying them from the very day that he met Maturana and Varela, which I think was in 68, actually. And in any case, he went down to Chile during the Chilean Revolution and visited them. He took a, a, a summer off and just happened to make a trip to Chile during the revolution to uh, <laughs> consult with uh, uh, Varela and Maturana. And he came back with these ideas. After having been, you know, one of the clients of the military and so on. He says this, Thomas Kuhn argues that, is, that a, there is a major change in paradigms when the one in vogue begins to fail, shows inconsistencies or contradictions. I, however, do you know who Thomas Kuhn is? Yeah. Uh, Thomas Kuhn is the philosopher who, who established, or the philosopher of science, who established the idea that science Proceeds itself proceeds by paradigms, that these paradigms are established, create what he calls normal science, the framework on which people agree on the great lines of investigation and they dedicate themselves to solving specific individual problems. Paradigms, however, according to Kuhn, collapse at a moment when normal science is challenged by basic hypotheses that cut through the practice of science and lead ultimately to the foundation of a new paradigm. So this has to do with my whole paradigm theory of my attempt to make Foucault uh, sort of more precise. Ludwig Fleck should be mentioned too here. Sorry? Ludwig Fleck. Ah, I actually don't know. That's oh, interesting. Well, we'll have to talk. That's great, that's great. After I, maybe uh, in a moment, we, could, we, could, we will talk about it. Sounds very interesting. So, Thomas Kuhn argues there's a major change in paradigms when the one in both begins to fail. I, Heinz von Forster, however, can name at least two instances in which not the emergent defectiveness of the dominant paradigm, but its very flawlessness is the cause for its rejection. One of these instances was Copernicus's novel, novel vision of a heliocentric planetary system, which he perceived at a time when the Ptolemaic geocentric system would at its height as to accuracy of its predictions. The other instance, I submit, is being brought about today by some of us who cannot, by their life, pursue any longer the flawless but sterile path that explores the properties seen to reside within objects, and therefore turn around to explore their very properties seen now to reside within the observer of these objects. From this it appears to be clear that social cybernetics must be a second-order cybernetics, a cybernetics of cybernetics in order that the observer who enters the system shall be allowed to stipulate his own purpose. He is autonomous. If we fail to do so, somebody else will determine a purpose for us. Moreover, if we fail to do so, we shall provide the excuses for those who want to transfer the responsibility for their own actions to somebody else. <coughs> I am not responsible for my actions. Finally, if we fail to recognize the autonomy of each, we may turn into a society that attempts to honor commitments and forgets about its own responsibilities. I think that's very interesting because of the role that Heinz von Forster played in, in the 
structured. He was the secretary of the Macy conferences. He edited the volumes from which the cybernetic discourse emerged. He uh, was always a very interesting guy. Uh, Wittgenstein, kind of wild Wittgenstein. And all that. And, but in the 60s, he clearly became, through his contact with Maturana and Doyle, and therefore with the Chilean Revolution, he clearly became a subversive force and the bearer of an, econ of a, of an ethical demand within those circuits of techno-scientific and military power on which uh, the American post-war period had been built. And so this is a fascinating, fascinating case of uh, this kind of transformation within, uh, within cybernetics. That was uh, Forster's sort of one of his sort of emblems. Um, his basic idea was that the observer must be con is part of what is observed, and therefore there's a reflexivity that comes in which makes you realize that you have an ethical role in whatever it is, whatever, um, whatever you do as a scientist. That you are creating the facts that you are establishing as scientific, and therefore you cannot make, you, can, you must make decisions about what sort of science you will do. That's a revolt within the science. That's an epistemological revolt. And, and, and actually a very important one. And what, what I would really like to get to, and what is also kind of in a much simpler and more primitive form expressed in my text on the flexible personality, is to show how this new salience of autonomy in the cultural mood of the, 19, the late 60s and the 1970s comes to be absorbed into a new system of society. So that what is, for a certain period, for the period of crisis, profound revolt and, a, and an innovation with tremendous ethical and philosophical force ultimately becomes absorbed into a new system which must change and adapt and become different in, able, in order to be able to absorb that perturbation, that element of disruption, that new demand. So one of the things that comes out of this, well, the things that come out of this are legion. They're the very characteristics of our societies where in general, society now does not seek to tell people what to do. Society seeks to transform the environment in which people will interact with each other and with machines. They try to exercise a meta-control or a second-order sort of control. So if you, if, if, say, American society or European society has problems with its students, wanting to study things like Marxism, like philosophy, like Heidegger, like 16th century poetry, like music and so on, and not be part of a capitalist society. You don't tell them, it's against the law to study Heidegger, it's against the law to study Marx and so on. You tell them, you can study whatever you want at a beautiful new university on a hill, you just have to take out a loan to do it. So you change the environment within which the study will take. Now we are, we're at a beautiful university on the hill, and we're, and, and, uh, and we're all involved in this game, myself no less than, than you. And so we are in, within a new system of constraints, which is vast, which is very, very vast. It can also be said that I can be a very productive subject, take an airplane all over the place, if I only will speak a rhetoric that somehow pleases the different people that I will meet where the airplane lands. In my case, it's usually a thing that's called a white cube, a museum. This environment here is new for me. However, I see the same kinds of constraints, and I believe that only by analyzing those constraints and analyzing uh, the, not only the environments, but also the figures who inhabit those environments, can we come to understand what society we're living in, and in fact, can we even see what society is now going into crisis? That's the whole point. So I think it would be interesting if you look at this. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives.
On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 19... Sorry? She was wearing an iPod. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course. Ridley Scott, you know, several million dollars, uh, 1.6 million dollars, a lot more at the time than it is today, uh, produced this commercial which was, you know, broadcast during the Super Bowl, uh, uh, like on January, whatever the Super Bowl is first, I think, uh, um, in, in 1984. And they announced, basically, I mean, who is the guy? In his face, the hammer is Big Brother. It's obviously Big Brother, and who else is it? Bill Gates, of course. It's IBM. Oh, no. It's the establishment of, it's really IBM, and, and of course, maybe Bill Gates as well, but above all, it's IBM. And the rising competitor that is Bill Gates, it's the big machine. It's McNamara. It's the American state. It's 1984. It's the threat of a kind of regimentation of society that all of 68 and all the crisis of the social and intellectual and, and artistic crisis of the 70s was against. And by this point, that has been made, even though the claim is that they're attacking ideology, that is in the process of being functionalized into a new ideology, which is the Macintosh ideology. It's the very ideology of the world on the screen. It's the ideology of the iPad, of the iPhone, of all these things which reflect your I to you as one part of a huge network of reflected eyes, of second order, self-reflected, uh, what I call flexible personalities. So, I think nothing could symbolize better this, um, the, the development of this new ideology than this uh, very sophisticated and strong commercial that, that, that <laughs> did inaugurate the career of a, of a major uh, company that, that is influential far beyond its, its economic uh, Cloud, especially because it seems to equip most of you with your uh, technology and also imprison you in its uh, abysmal, uh, abysmally closed operating system, uh, which of course is very easy, very nice, very luxurious, but has nowhere near the poetry of a uh, Linux uh, uh, self uh, made, uh, open, costless, uh, uh, highly uh, evolutionary uh, computer system like the one that I'm uh, glad to use after a few years of effort. Um, uh, because you have to fight, you know, you have to fight ideologies. They don't just disappear on their own. They disappear because they're recognized for what they are and they're challenged. Uh, uh, that's why I mentioned in this context, you know, the entire free software projects, because of course it has recognized that this claim to overcome ideology here is, has in fact been the foundation <coughs> of, new, of a new ideology which is not just limited to Apple, obviously, but it's rather the entire flexible and financialized system that we, we're discussing here. So, characteristics of that system. Have you, has anyone read the book by David Harvey that I cited before uh, on the, post, the condition of post-modernity? Raise your hands. It's a great book. It's really worth reading. If this class interests you at all, read it. He, he, took the concept of, well, he forged the concept of flexible accumulation in that book. Um, this diagram I actually take from Manuel Castell's book uh, uh, on the Network Society, also a, book, a, a good book, but not as good as David Hardy's, I'm afraid, um, and 16 times longer. Um, a new sort of organizational form begins to arise out of this new toolkit, this new technological kit, out of this new orientation toward the autonomy of the individual and out of the new communicational network that begins to, to work when the personal computers are plugged into the internet. It can be called flexible accumulation. It gives rise, no longer do we have a pyramidal organization like the Ford Motor Company or GM, we have instead a kind of modular thing with a core group that is basically, this is the enterprise. With a peripheral group where you have flexible employment, you can hire and fire as you like, because of course there are no more laws against that. You have other peripheral groups, which are short-term con contractors, subsidized trainees, uh, uh, delayed recruitment, they, they send you off for more training and stuff, which you must pay, you pay for yourself, jobs, and part-time, and so on. <laughs> then you have actually outsourcing, 
self-employment that feeds in, that doesn't have to be insured, doesn't, doesn't have to be paid for, no risk is borne by the, the so this is usually us, who are you know, self-employment, uh, no insurance, or et cetera, subcontracting, temporary agencies. So uh, the new sort of flexible thing which I described here in the text that I've asked, this is just a quote from Flexible Personality, no reason to get into that right now, you probably already read it. This is kind of what it starts to look like. Uh, cars get produced uh, all over the world. In fact, you know, parts of them are produced in France and those are sent to Great Britain and then the cars, you know, um, are finally assembled in the USA and it's uh, uh, with some additional Mexican and probably Korean parts in it. Um, we'll discuss that uh, at greater length uh, later on. What can be called informationalism, I prefer to call it, you know, neoliberal informationalism, uh, really takes off with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with two things, really. You can't restrict it to the fall of the Wall. The Berlin Wall falls. Vast space is opened up in the world where capital can expand. But capital is afraid to expand in that space, because what could happen there? You could be robbed. You could be mugged. A war could start. A civil war could start. A new form of the, the, something like the Soviet Union could happen. God knows what, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Iranian Revolution that had happened in 1979. The world is a very dangerous place. What happens in 1990 and 1991? The Gulf War, the largest military coalition ever assembled in history. The exact opposite of what George W. Bush did in, in the 2000s. Bush Sr. assembled the entire capitalist world to uh, defeat Saddam Hussein. And what did that do? That gave businessmen confidence that the fall of the Berlin Wall did not signal an entry into a period of chaos, but rather signaled a secure world in which something like the dot-com boom could happen. And it did. And the dot-com boom was not just speculation and money making money. Of course it was money making money. Look what happened in the NASDAQ index. Money was making a lot of money, a lot more money than it was making goods. But at the same time as money was making money, money was laying cables across the entire earth. Money was setting up those communication centers which are now the nodes of the financial network. In each place, money was creating new airports, new hotels, new uh, uh, luxury districts, new uh, universities to train new subjects which could fulfill the requirements of that flexible enterprise whose diagram we saw just a moment ago. So although there was this incredible speculation, which of course had its bust, you know, um, came to its peak, you know, on this date, you know, March 10th, 2000, and immediately thereafter went into a real... Something happened. Informationalism, which had been nascent uh, in the period from the 1970s onward, where all those innovations that I talked about yesterday had been accumulating with no way to put them into effect, with, uh, with, with no, you know, in the time of a recession, the 1970s, a huge recession that went on for year, years and years and years, uh, suddenly those, that huge uh, stockpile of innovations found a planetary space into which it could expand. A planetary space the entire former Soviet Union, and progressively, all of China and India. Not to mention everywhere else. Because everywhere on the planet, there is not a developed society like that of Europe or increasingly that of China, but there are nodes of the global network. You find them everywhere. And so, this vast expansion of, of capital, driven by the twin technologies of the personal computer and the collective infrastructure of, uh, that creates the possibilities of the internet and of every other network, those thousands and thousands of miles of glass cable that are laid under sea uh, to join the continents, that expansion occurred and what it meant was that the form of the flexible enterprise could be installed very rapidly all over the former east, all throughout China, and to a lesser extent throughout the so something tremendous happened in the 1990s, which is the big phase of capital expansion, which has now run its course and it's entering its crisis. And I think it's really important to do what people usually don't do, which is to combine these two images and these two historical memories, this memory of the, the uh, fall of the wall, and this memory, which uh, 
whose real nature is often forgotten. Its nature is this huge coalition. It was not just the United States that uh, invaded Iraq. It was this vast coalition for which Japan paid the bill, by the way. Sorry, what was your definition of uh, Sorry. Informationalism is what I've basically been defining the whole way. Neoliberal no, information. Uh, it's it? not the definition. You said something else, like you prefer calling it informationalism. I prefer to call it neoliberal informationalism. Because informationalism would be the technological uh, and, and maybe, if you will, organizational side. But you also need a political side. You need the techno and the politics. The politics is neoliberal. And the neoliberal will, will go into tomorrow in, in greater detail what it is, because now there's no longer any time, because it's now seven. Uh, but um, tomorrow, I, I have a few more things to... What I want to do tomorrow is to offer you a second figure. Again, a real person, uh, an actual human being, uh, who can incarnate, perhaps, uh, for you the subjectivity of neoliberal informationalism. And of course, that's associated with this idea of the flexible personality. So if you haven't read that text, it would be great if it's possible to read it tonight. It's also associated with what Paolo Virno calls the ambivalence of disenchantment. That is to say, a new kind of freedom, a new kind of autonomy, which is ambivalent. It can be for the better, but it can also be for the worse. And what Virna says, and I mean, it's really pretty fascinating the way that he puts it. You might just to end, just look at it. It's the one that it's on the syllabus, uh, and it's called The Ambivalence of Disenchantment. And uh, it's also right here on the screen. And I just wanted to quote one thing from it. Before reading, so it just took me a second to find that. Um, transformation of work, which is obviously the case in the flexible society. Uh, he says, uh, he, he talks about the movements of the, si uh, the 60s signaling their opposition, their utter disagreement with the, the laws that force people to labor, you know. They vindicated the right to non-work. They enacted a collective migration out from the regime of the factory. This is the, the theme of exodus in the uh, thought of the Italian autonomists. They recognized the parasitic character of working for a boss. Nevertheless, in the 1980s, the status quo triumphed in its untruth. In what seems like an all too serious joke, the end of the society of worth has occurred in the very forms prescribed by the social system of wage labor itself. Unemployment resulting from reinvestment, flexibility as despotic rule, early retirement, the task of managing all the free time created by the absence of full-time work, the reappearance of relatively primitive productive sectors alongside innovative and driving sectors of the economy, and the revival of archaic disciplinary measures for controlling individuals no longer subordinated to the rules of the factory system. All this stands before us. Very, it's a very strong text. Have, have any of you read those things? Do you, I don't know how this EGS works and whether people really read the text and America they never read the text. Tell me, do you? Did you read it? I want to know. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. If you don't, it's fine. There's no problem at all. I read some of the ones who are in your blog and you can... Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's a, there's a syllabus for the class that several, I think, uh, established. Should we post it in the Hopefully it is, but who knows? Maybe it's not even posted in the forum. I don't know. It is. So, Raise your hand if you read the text, just so I know. It doesn't Wait, matter text. if you do not. The two texts that should have been read for today are The Flexible Personality and The Ambivalence of Disenchantment. Followed by two more texts, which are the one called The Speculative Performance, and another one by Cameron Rossettina. Followed by a long and difficult text on Felix Guattari, and a whole book by Felix Guattari called Chaosmosis. I actually don't expect you to have read it, uh, Actually, anything. I don't care whether you read it or not, I just want to know. 
So in other words, half, more, a little more than half of you have read it. That means we can have a discussion about that tomorrow morning. And, and uh, uh, what, what we'll do is I'll, I'll show 10 more slides. It'll take uh, half an hour uh, to 45 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion for the first half of the uh, period tomorrow. Thank you very much for your patience. Let's